This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale, and today I'm going to be talking to Jonathan Rigby, who is a historian, a writer, an actor, producer, and a consultant on uh, many documentaries. His area of expertise, I would say, is uh, horror movies. He's written a series of wonderful books, um, English Gothic, American Gothic, and Euro Gothic, and is currently working on the second volume of the American Gothic book. We talk about a lot of things, and he's got some great recommended books right at the end. If you enjoy the episode, please remember to like and spread the word as far, far and wide as you possibly can. Rate it on whichever podcast platform you use. Review, share on Twitter, on Facebook, social media, all the way across. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Twitter... Uh, at Twitter. What a twit. At... Dr. John T, uh, D-R-J-O-N-T-Y. And also, I'd like to plug, uh, if I may, that we're about to start pre-code April, hashtag pre-code April, which is a month-long season of watching pre-code films with some great film enthusiasts, critics, writers, what have you. The person who, who you need to follow in order to get all the information on Twitter is Matthew Turner at FilmFan1971. At FilmFan1971. So follow him, click on the hashtag and find the lists of people and, and get involved. Watching pre-code films is amazing. will open your eyes to a whole other dimension of cinema if you haven't already if you haven't already been there, you're in for a treat. But before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. Well, way back in 1990, I um, had the idea to write a book about British horror films. And uh, I think I got in contact with Peter Cushing and uh, things like that, but uh, that sort of didn't quite get off the ground for reasons too tedious to go into. In fact, I've forgotten most of them. Uh, but in um, in '94, um, Marvel was starting up a new magazine called Hammer Horror, and uh, the editor Marcus Hearn got in touch with a young actor writer called Mark Gatiss, mm. who was going to become very well known subsequently, and asked him to contribute to it. But because Mark and I had done a play not too long before, and he'd realised what a fellow Hammer fan I was, and horror fan generally, he um, said, no, 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 it's not me you want, it's this guy. And he directed Marcus to me, which was very, very selfless of him. Uh, mind you, he was writing lots of successful Edinburgh shows at the time, so maybe he just didn't have the time. But it was very, very generous and selfless of him and as a result I started writing for that magazine at the same time I started uh, writing for a magazine here in the UK called Shivers which is defunct now but mm. was uh, going strong at the time and um, and so that's basically how it started in the 90s and around about 96 I thought that idea about writing a book about British horror films um, let's start that up again and I did and it came out in 2000 and uh, well you know and, and I sort of went on from there if you like. And so that first one was British Gothic. Well, it was actually called English Gothic. And a few people have complained about the fact that it, strictly speaking, should have been called British Gothic. Um, but I just, I, in, in a, a rather indefensible way, I just felt that English Gothic has, has more of a poetic ring to it. I think it may be the, uh, the, the clashing G's in there. Ah, right, yeah, it's a little bit of internal alliteration. Yeah, Internal alliteration. Uh, don't ask me why. It's a, it's a thing that I can't readily explain, but it has upset one or two people because, of course, I deal with Britain rather than just England. Why did you sort of focus on the idea of the Gothic rather than... Because, you know, you said you're, you're writing a, a book of horror movies, but Gothic feels to me like it's a particular flavour or inflection that you want to strike. Well, I think that's largely because... Um, I think I probably prefer the uh, full-on Gothic mode, but I will happily 
uh, hold up my hand and say that Gothic, and uh, quite a few people have uh, found this, Gothic is an awfully difficult concept to actually define. Mm. Uh, and I think in many ways it runs through the majority of, of horror films, really. And in, in the books, I, I don't... Um, I don't make any real discrimination if a, if a film strikes me as being a horror film. Uh, of course, the horror is such a hugely amorphous genre that there's a lot of disagreement even on that, never mind on something more specific like Gothic. Uh, if something strikes me as a horror film, I will write about it. I, I remember a lot of people of my generation were very influenced by a book that came out in 1973 by Dennis Gifford, which was called A Pictorial History of Horror Movies. Mm. And in that, he was um, he was very prescriptive in that. I mean, it's a very influential book, and people relished in particular all the wonderful illustrations. But he was very prescriptive. He um, insisted that um, he would only talk about films with some form of supernatural or science fiction uh, uh, material in them. And, and he actually expressly said, in other words, we will not be talking about films like Psycho. Mm. <laughs> and I think if you exclude Psycho from the history of horror films, you're excluding a rather important, um, you know, kind of benchmark film, which as it happens, despite being set in what was then contemporary America, is steeped in Gothic uh, motifs. And yet is about, you know, the, the sort of template slasher killer of modern times. So yes, I, I feel Gifford was a little too prescriptive there. So I, I try to, it's it's a very sort of a Catholic church as it were, it's very widespread and I try to embrace as much of it as seems to me to rate as, as horror. And how did you how did you first get this passion for horror then? What was it, was the uh, something that you watched kind of at an early age that imprinted you with this sort of lurid <laughs> <laughs> sort of passion? Well, that's perfectly true. I mean, I recently, uh, I recently got an award. <laughs> I think it may be my first. It was a rondo, and it was called. Uh, it was called a Monster Kid Hall of Fame. Excellent. And I thought, I thought, well, yes, I was delighted, but I was also slightly perplexed as a Brit because we didn't have this Monster Kid institution in the 60s and 70s. Or rather, we had it, but we didn't know we had it. We, we didn't have anybody like Forrest J. Ackerman, who was editing Famous Monsters of Filmland. We didn't have anyone like him to tell us that we were monster kids. It was only later, we, we, you know, in the early 70s, in my case, for instance, you know, uh, I wasn't, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't feel like a freak exactly, but it was nice later on to find out that there were loads of other young boys and girls relishing Dennis Gifford's book and other books of that period. Uh, suddenly you realise that you, you know, you weren't alone. So, so there were monster kids, but it wasn't a kind of thing. I remember uh, sort of my elder brother watched The Haunting on television with my father in, I think, 1972, and um, I wasn't allowed to watch. Um, but he came back and told me how he was scared witless by that film, and that in, that intrigued me. And later on, they watched the original Universal Frankenstein, and I sneaked a peek at that literally through the um, crack in the door in the door frame. Mm. And I watched the opening scene, and I I think maybe I was aware that you know my position was actually rather similar to that of Dwight Fry and Colin Clive in the film where they're looking through the cemetery gates waiting for the funeral to finish. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I, I I couldn't risk watching more than the prologue. So so I was I don't know I'm becoming very intrigued. In 1973, I was fascinated by horror films, but I still hadn't watched very many. I watched the Bela Lugosi Dracula, was fascinated by that. And then um, I'll try and cut a long story short. No, no, <laughs> make a short story long if you prefer. It's fine okay. with me. <laughs> no, my father, my father was quite keen on horror films too. Would regale me with stories of going on business trips and dropping in to see Dracula, Prince of Darkness in you know provincial cinemas and things. And I was fascinated by all this. And when Dracula Has Risen from the Grave was first shown on UK TV, in I think April 1974. Uh, it was a six year old film. And of course, to a young boy at that time, that seemed like it was out of the arc. You know, mm. if a film is six years old, that's ancient history to an 11 year old. But nevertheless, I was terribly excited. And he instituted um, something that would actually become a bit of a routine with us. He would put me to bed at 7 p.m. Uh, then he'd eventually he'd watch news at 10. And when news at 10 was over, he'd come upstairs. This is at 10.30, of course, mm -hmm. and bring me down to watch 
appointment with fear or whatever the strand was called and the first of these was dracula has risen from the grave and i was uh, blown away by it you know i was just mm. the, the whole uh, gothic if you like ambiance of it and uh, the luridness of it as you say and also christopher lee's extraordinary power and presence as a kind of you know the the uh, trademark demon lover and particularly his death throes at the end oh and it, well, actually he's, he's effectively killed twice in that film he's staked and then subsequently he falls onto a giant golden crucifix and his his physical actually his physical acting in those scenes for which i still to this day don't think he's given enough credit his his physical acting in that film and sorry we just had the doorbell go That's um, okay. his his physical you can cut that bit if you like, can't you? His physical acting in uh, in that just, uh, you know, I, I was sold. Let's put it like that. I was sold. And from that point on, I was um, wild about horror films and saw an unfeasibly large number at a possibly unhealthily young age. But that's OK. I've, I've turned out all right, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how horror is the only sort of film uh, genre that... I, if I hit, it seems to pass by word of mouth really readily. You know, if somebody tells me, "Oh, there's this film where this happens," I, I have to watch it, and it's always yeah. a horror horror film. It, it never happens with you know. Nobody ever says, "Oh, there's this war film where they attack a castle uh, on a cable car," <laughs> and I think, "Oh, I've got to see that." I mean, I mean, I love wearing eagles there, but it's not you know. Whereas somebody tells me, "Oh, there's a guy gets cut in half by a cable," it's like, "Oh, what, what's it called? Omen Two, right? I've got to see that." Then that's the uh, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's a spectacular scene in that lift. Yes, I must say. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, you know you're absolutely right. I, I mean, there's a there is a very cultish fascination that has formed around horror films to a far greater degree than than other genres. I mean, you know, there was well, you know, I started out by writing for a magazine called Hammer Horror. Mm. As far as I'm aware, there has never been a magazine called Ealing Comedy. Mm. You know, it's just horror does attract this cultish interest, which, you know, of course. Of course, there are many, many, many wild and uh, d devoted fans of Ealing comedy out there. You know, I might even be one of them myself, but they do mm. not get the same sort of momentum behind them, if you like. It's it's an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Really. Costume drama monthly. No, you see, it's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Unless there's a real gap in the market and just nobody's understood that. They're doing, waiting <laughs> for, possible. you know, 20 pages supplements on Merchant Ivory. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you so you said you watched an unfeasible number of horror movies and this is like this must be in the you know late 70s early 80s how are you, how are you getting these was this uh with the birth of the sort of VHS phenomenon or or oh well initially in the 70s yeah. of course one was dependent on on what happened to be shown on television Right, uh, which actually was quite a lot in those days. I, I, ha I happened to find a diary for 1975 recently, and it was effectively an appointments diary. But for the 12-year-old me, an appointments diary meant a list of which horror films I saw on which day. Right. And um, there were a lot. Of course, this was also um, in the latter part of the 70s. The BBC, BBC Two started doing these venerated horror double bills at the weekend which, a bit like the Dennis Gifford book I mentioned, you know, made a huge impact on, on a whole generation of young people. And, um, you know, I think there, there are whole websites devoted to those BBC Two double bills with people, you know, tabulating exactly what was shown on what day. Again, this is the lure, the strange lure of, of horror. And then, of course, yes, as you say, going into the 80s, uh, VHS comes along and explosively and you know so one's watching a lot that way but of course I'm also I also start going to see them at the cinema um I I think um, I think we can admit this into the realm of horror I certainly included it in English Gothic there was a horror comedy film <laughs> with Frankie Howard called The House in Nightmare Park wow. written by Terry Nation and Clive Exton two very distinguished writers uh and 
directed by Peter Sykes, who was a Hammer director, though this wasn't a Hammer film, and I actually saw that in the cinema that in 1973. That may have been the first. But subsequent to that, I remember films like Burnt Offerings, which was a Dan Curtis film. and, and uh, a With Ol- Oliver Reed, I think. This is- With Oliver Reed and Karen Black and Betty Davis, that's right. right. And also quite some quite obscure items like Curtis Harrington's Ruby. There, I saw rather random horror movies in the cinema in the 70s. And then... I think there may have been a time, actually, when VHS was really riding high. I was at university, and I think I went into a very odd phase, which I find inexplicable now. I was, you know, uh, passing into my early 20s, and I went through a very strange phase of sort of putting away childish things. Mm. Or imagining I was putting away Mm. A dangerous phase. I've done that myself. Have you? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely sort of gone. My Star Wars figures are all going in a bag and I'm going to give them to a younger relative and I'm not going to read science fiction anymore because I've discovered Jack Kerouac. Exactly. Well, and it was also the period when if you're at university, you're also a bit cash strapped. So you start to get rid of all your old LPs. And then, you know, about 10 years later, you start to rebuy them because you realize what a terrible mistake that was. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I, 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 I did, it, did that to a degree. But, you know, if, for instance, and I remember this while I was at university, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell comes on the telly. Uh, I was there. So it was still bubbling under. And yet, I, on one sort of level, I very briefly, I, I wouldn't say I ever lost my interest in it, but but my focus on it sort of wavered briefly. I didn't lose the interest exactly, but it ceased to be a kind of focus. And then I think I went to drama school after university. And mm. I think it was at some point while at drama school that... Um, that the interest came back. I know Christopher Lee, we're back on him now. Christopher Lee did a signing at Tower Records in Piccadilly in 1987 and actually ducked out of a rehearsal of The Seagull in order to go and have him sign my old 1970s photos of him. Um, I apologise to all my old drama school friends. I I did actually duck out of that rehearsal quite <laughs> illegitimately. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and um, and so, so yes, I think while I was at university, it, the sort of focus wavered, but the interest was still there sub, in a subterranean way. And then it came back. And, and, by the, and of course, by 1990, as I said, I was actually planning a book on British horror films. So, I mean, it obviously, it had come back in earnest by then. And a curious, curious process. I still don't quite understand that. <laughs> putting away childish things. Why would one want to do that? I, I know, but I, I, there's a sort of feeling of uh, immaturity that sort of, uh, and silliness that kind of sticks to them. <laughs> and you think, no, no, that this new stuff is much more serious. I'm going to listen to jazz instead of Pink Floyd. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. And then after a while, you think, oh, I'm bored of jazz. I'm going to go back to Pink Floyd now. <laughs> um, or, I'll, or I'm going to like both, which is, uh, of course, the best, that is the, the that best is the, solution. The best solution, yeah, absolutely. I think you realise that um, there's a power invested in, in it that, that, that spoke to you as a very young person because you were very receptive to it as a boy or girl. And um, as a, you know, as a, as a child, basically, you're very receptive to that power. And, and you know, when you get to be uh, sort of late teens or early twenties, you maybe want to put that aside. You sort of forget about the elemental power of it that spoke to you as a child. And then, uh, and then it just suddenly speaks to you again. And as you sort of devolve into your second childhood, as I suppose I am now, then the, the, the power, is, is, is all the more well potent, put it that way. Were you focused on uh, English horror? Was that always a predilection or, or was it, it just sort of, I'm going to do that for the book just, just to sort of specialise in something? No, not, not specifically. Um, I've, you know, I, I, I loved horror from, you know, wherever I could get it. Mm. But I, I was very aware that I was, I was brought up in Windsor. So... For us, apart from anything else, I was aware that a lot of the... Well, in Windsor, you're close to so many of the studios, uh, but you're specifically, you're awfully close to Bray Studios. Um, in fact, Bray Studios' address is Windsor. Right. And uh, so, you know, and I was aware that, you know, uh, up to 1966, uh, the classic Hammer films were all made. The majority of them were all made at Bray Studios. <clears throat> and subsequently, they'd gone to Elstree and Pinewood. But even those were relatively, you know, handy for Windsor. So because I was in that sort of film studio sort of nexus or district, um, I think maybe that may have contributed to the 
to the particular interest I had in British horror films. I think I was particularly interested in the fact that horror was such a sneered upon uh, genre in Britain, particularly by uh, the film establishment for so long. And yet it is so indivisibly British a thing. I mean, obviously it's not exclusively British, but uh, Britain, you know, I mean, Britain provided us with that little um, that little house party at the Villa Diodati in 1816. <laughs> you know, the the you know everybody trooped out from Britain to Switzerland to uh, hatch Frankenstein and effectively Dracula indirectly at that house party. So, and it was very interesting that it was so. I think the screenwriter Stephen Volk, uh, who's a who's a friend of mine, is a lovely man, and but he put it awfully well in the 90s when British horror was pretty much dead. And we'd switched back to um, the film establishment having no interest in it or time for it. He, point, he's, he said, Gothic and horror generally is, is rooted in the soil here. Mm. And yet it's so hard to get anybody interested. I thought that was a fantastic quote, rooted in the soil here. And yet so many people here aren't aware of that fact. And, and just aren't interested. I think it's a, you've either got that horror gene, as it were, or you haven't. Hmm. And I think for long stretches, the majority <laughs> of the British film establishment, critical establishment generally, haven't had it. And like Stephen Volk, I puzzle over that because it is rooted in the soil here. It's in so much of our TV as well. I mean, you know, Doctor Who and all the, um, you know, uh, Terry Nation did Blake Seven. They always had this sort of macabre uh, quarter mass. And, you know, I mean, I'm giving sort of science fiction-y examples, but they've always got a, 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 you know, Doctor Who used to terrify me. Well, there's a huge crossover between horror and science fiction anyway. But, you know, Nigel Neal, uh, the great um, screenwriter who, 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 Deri who, who hated to be stamped as a science fiction writer. He felt his stuff was about far more than, you know, I mean, okay, his stuff involved rockets and, mm. and Martians from time to time, but nevertheless, he was trading in much more ancient things. He was also writing very contemporary stories, but the imagery was very, very ancient. I mean, the, um, the Martians in Quatermass and the Pit are five million years old. Mm. Um, and so he was trading in, you know, very gothic if you like motifs and he was fusing that with science fiction now that's a fantastic um, combination and I, I, that's just another example of what i said you know the, the, the genre is so vast and takes in so much and uh, i don't when i embarked on writing english gothic which was in 1996 um uh, well given that it's had a, a couple of sequels and i'm working on a on a third by which I mean books with Gothic in the title. Um, I, I didn't realise quite what I was embarking on, but also, of course, I didn't realise quite what I was embarking on in terms of the vastness of it. I mean, just British horror films alone is a huge territory, and it became even huger in the 21st century. After that period in the 90s that I mentioned, when nobody was interested, suddenly uh, there were a few films that came out in 2002, um, 28 Days Later, I suppose, being the most well-remembered of them. Uh, and suddenly, well, I think British filmmakers became aware that horror was, amongst other things, very cheap. It's, mm. uh, it's quite cheap to make, you know, and, and, and of course, horror can often act as a kind of calling card, um, maybe for filmmakers who want to go on and do something else, or maybe for filmmakers who really do have that passion for horror. And there were several in the 21st century. And so suddenly, because I, uh, I actually wrote a, a big addendum to English Gothic and a new edition came out in 2015, which dealt with this huge outburst, this explosion of activity in the 21st century. And uh, yeah, suddenly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more films were out there to consider. And uh, so on that occasion, I was certainly aware of the scope of it. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was uh, vast. Anyway, there we go. David Putnam, I remember in an interview, actually said, I think this was during the 80s, he sort of said as advice to filmmakers, make a horror movie because it will teach you everything you need to know about making a film and you can do it for cheap. And, you know, 
very frequently it's kind of the, the twists and turns of a horror film are, are, are the special effects, if you like, and they're, they're kind of cheap to do if you if you can do them well. Um, well, that's very encouraging to hear that he said that. Um, I'm not aware that he ever made a horror film, but um, uh, <laughs> correct me by all means if I'm wrong. No, but, I, I, I'm, I'm but, trying to think, but no, I'm not sure but, Chariots of Fire doesn't count, does it? No, not quite, no. But, um, you know, great. No, I'm delighted that he said that. Yeah. Um, and um, I think a lot of filmmakers have followed that lead. Yeah. Make a horror film. It's a useful calling card, if you do it well, of course, because. Uh, much as I love horror films, it would be it would be uh, silly not to admit that there's an awful lot of bad ones out there. But you know mm. that's part of the thrill. You sort through the the bad ones and you find the gems, don't you? Yeah, yeah the, the there, sort are, of... there are many, and there are many, many, many gems. Yeah, the ninety percent of everything is shit sort of um, quote from <laughs> Theodore Sturgeon. I think the science fiction writer oh, oh, yeah, yeah. had Sturgeon's <laughs> Law. Um, <Okay>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I wouldn't put it that high, but <laughs> even so. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's, let's, uh, let's be a bit more generous than good old yeah, Theodore. Yeah. Indeed. Um, um, when you when you sort of widened out uh, your your scope from the you know already vast scope of uh, the English Gothic and you you did the American and you did the European did you do it in that order or did you do European first? I am um, uh, no uh, you got me no no well English Gothic came first uh, in two thousand and seven American Gothic came out and then. Uh, in the middle of the last decade, I was writing Eurogothic, and at the same time, I wrote that expanded English Gothic. Right. And it had a big extra chunk nailed on the end. Uh, so, yes, so the, that new English Gothic came out in 2015, and then Eurogothic itself finally came out in 2016. So, so the order, strictly speaking, was English, American, Euro. And I am now writing um, American Gothic 2. Right. Because, as some people have um, um, complained slightly, um, American Gothic ends just before Psycho, mm. which struck me as a very useful cutoff point. And people have, you know, I don't, I don't know that they're complaining exactly, but people have regretted the fact that it ends there. Uh, and uh, my only response to that would be, uh, have you not noticed how big and fat American Gothic is anyway? going up to 1959, it would just be unfeasible to have to have written a longer book than that, which is why I am now writing American Gothic 2. And even that only goes up to 1985. It's only adding another 25 years because, of course, with Psycho as its sort of starting point, American horror went absolutely berserk. Of course it did, uh, particularly in the 70s and 80s. So, so yes, I am finally writing American Gothic 2, which for various reasons has been taking quite a long time, but it will eventually come out for all those who are sorry that I <clears throat> finished in 1959. Yeah, they must be cl clamouring, clamouring for more, because of course, uh, uh, <laughs> Psycho invents its own sort of subgenre as well. Well, uh, well, yes, I mean, it, it took time, I suppose. I mean, there were a lot, I mean, as soon as Psycho came out, any any number of it films influenced by it came out, of course. But, uh, you know, it's looking at everything, looking at things very simplistically, the thing that then absolutely set the so-called slasher mode was Halloween, and a good 18 years had elapsed. But mm. uh, it's very interesting seeing, you know, that there was, of course, there was a huge amount of stuff actually filling in that gap between Psycho and Halloween and tending towards that Halloween moment, if you like. Um, and then um, slasher films were um, were omnipresent, and uh, I think I was a little bit rude about slasher films in um, English Gothic. Mm. But you know, with the, the more you delve into the genre, the more you learn. And, and uh, in researching American Gothic too, I've gone back to an unfeasible number of slasher films, uh, and. Um, I certainly find them uh, a lot more interesting than I used to, but this is part, again, part of the process. <clears throat> you watch a film at a certain age and you may not like it. You watch it again, maybe 20 years later, and you think, my God, I, I was so blind. This is a fantastic film. And of course, the reverse can also be the case. <laughs> oh, 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 heaven forfend. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you can adore a film at you know in your teens and you watch it 20 or 30 years later and think oh my god it just doesn't hold up does it you know but but you know this is the weird process that you go through and watching films I remember Highlander being like the my Citizen Kane of films, and then re rewatching it, it's like, oh my god, this is terrible trash. I mean, oh, great, really? Great fun, but but you know. Oh, that's interesting because I saw that at the time in the cinema, and I thought it was terrible. Maybe I should now rewatch Highlander, and I'll think it's brilliant. Yeah, well, may, maybe you'll see me passing in the other direction. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, absolutely. At the midpoint. Um, I I was wondering because you're watching so many of these films and you're and I, reading uh, Eurogothic. I consider my I don't consider myself in any way an expert or authority, but I've certainly watched a lot of European horror movies, yeah. and and I'm st I was just like re reading it with a with a notepad and writing down a list of over a hundred films that I I've got to I've got to see this and I've got to see that and I've got to see the you know. Um, do you ever um, do you still get scared by horror movies? Ah, that's an interesting question. Not very often. Mm. Uh, not very often. There comes a point when you've seen so many uh, w w with modern horror films, very often you're just aware of all the derivations. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with derivations. You know, obviously everything is built on, on a sort of system of derivations because there are only so many stories. And uh, but in a way that kind of takes you out of the film because uh, you know a little knowledge is a dangerous thing if you like. So I think it is. I th I think what I've, what has always excited me about the horror genre, and maybe this amounts to being scared. I don't know, but I've always been aware of being thrilled by it and thrilled by particular moments, just things that leap up and uh, uh, and hit you whether that actually means that they're scaring you is, is is a difficult one to to quantify but i do still get that feeling of of being thrilled and excited i mean the, the films i saw in the 70s as a boy i was I, for instance hammer films I think they, you know, the very early Hammer films, I think, scared the bejesus out of people at the time mm. because they'd never seen anything like them. But uh, quite quickly, they settled into, into a home county's gothic mode that was um, almost welcoming and, um, and, and, and a pleasant place to be. Um, but they still... They, they're almost like adventure films. And I, I, <laughs> I applied this to horror films generally as a boy because they excited me. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there, there are moments in British horror films of that classic period, 50s, 60s and early 70s, that uh, just really thrilled me. To what degree I was ever scared, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean for instance, you know, I mentioned uh, Quatermass in the Pit earlier. Yes, there's a there's a scene at the end of that where the Martian intelligence actually assumes a kind of physical form, and yet it's a kind of ectoplasmic form, a, a sort of towering, devil-horned Martian image flickering over London like a mm. sort of giant hovering over all the terraced houses, and the not Quatermass himself, but his associate, Professor Roney, Dr. Roney, I beg your pardon, is, um, is the self-sacrificing self -sacrificing heroic guy who climbs to the top of a train and manipulates... Good God, I can't speak today. Who climbs to the top of a crane. <laughs> climbs to the top of a crane and manipulates the crane into the terrible Martian image right into its face and, uh, and thus sort of neutralises the image. He literally earths it. and But, of course, he dies in the process and that scene particularly with Tristram Carey's electronic strange blah, 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 strange uh, hard to describe um, synthesizer sounds underneath to indicate the rippling power of the Martian force you know sort of sweeping over London and emanating from this ectoplasmic shape and the sheer heroism of Dr. Roney and a really rather good, I think, special effect from Les Bowie of the terrible Martian face in the sky. 
this thrilled me beyond words. It, it seemed to me to be, to be a profound image, something very curious. And, and, and it really spoke to something very, I, I, you know, I mean, the whole point of that story is that <laughs> five million year old Martians have had a huge impact <laughs> on the human race. Uh, and um, so there did seem to be something profound about this birthing of the Martian malevolence. Mm. Mm. And yet I watched that film recently with somebody who'd never seen it. Certainly never seen it as a child. And uh, the scene made no particular impact on them at all. Oh, how disappointing! <laughs> so, well, well, you know, it's it's just. Uh, I suppose there comes a point, you know, if if you weren't exposed to these films uh, at a young age, there comes a point where it's just another movie, you know. And mm. There are so many movies to watch, and uh, I think so. That particular, you say, are you still ever scared? I, 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 uh, I think I can be, but the actual thrill of it is is something very connected to to you know when when you're a young person because that's when you're most susceptible i suppose and that's why it's important not to put away childish things because you need mm. to keep that if you like childlike view in order to be thrilled you know let's try not to become too jaded it can be an uphill struggle but it's very important to to retain that and then if a film shows me something as thrilling as profoundly thrilling as that martian image in the sky then I am quite capable of being thrilled again. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, I, I love that way you describe the, the, the thrillingness of it and the, the fear factor as, as so, almost separate things as well, because I recently watched um, Dario Argento's opera and the scene where um, a woman gets shot through the spy hole of her door and it hits, yeah. it hits the telephone that, that someone else is trying to reach for. I, I just remember just being... You know, I've only that's the first time I watched it was like a few weeks ago and just almost wanting to cheer because it was just such a thrillingly set up moment, you know. Yes, well, that, yeah, well, Argento has lots of moments, right? Yeah, yeah and uh, and but the fear thing of, of horror has always stayed with me. I'm always scared of horror movies. Um, I, I kind of can't, some, some of them I can't really watch. I mean, I'll watch. I'll watch them and then I'll sort of fast forward to see where the killer is and rewind and then watch it knowing, okay, he's going to jump out of that door because it would just disturb me so much. I mean, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, <laughs> to this day, I find difficult to sit all the way through. I have to sort of distract, go, you know, get up and get a drink or something, pause it just so I can, you know, I can't take it all at the same time. Well, I, I must say, uh, there's a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre out there now, isn't there? Which I haven't seen yet. Yeah, I've, I've watched um, it. it. It really fits oh, yeah. in with your description of action movie. Oh, does it? Yeah, it's very much oh. an action movie dressed up as a horror film. Ah, that's interesting. Well, of course, it's, it's attracted enormously polarised views, as everything seems to nowadays. You know, something's either absolutely brilliant or it's complete garbage. You know, there doesn't seem to be any middle way nowadays. But, I, but I, I, it's on my list to watch. But the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, in many ways, I think, the perfect horror film. Uh, I mean, you know, that really is a horror film. And rem remarkably, it manages to be the ultimate horror film without, oddly enough, shedding all that much blood. Whereas the new one, I believe, is spectacularly gruesome. But uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a horror film because I think what you you know what you were saying is it, it gets under your skin. I mean, the, the sort of fetid atmosphere of a Texan summer is so intense in that film, and the, the film is I mean you you almost have to mop your brow watching the thing, <laughs> uh, and, and and it's um there's something fetid and ghastly about it and it's brilliantly put together and it is a film of real dread and unease that's a very difficult thing to achieve i think in films that feeling of actual dread it also has those staggering moments that stay with you we were talking about moments earlier there's a moment when um, leatherface suddenly flings aside a steel door and there he is with a red wall behind him and various trophies on the wall. And he just bludgeons a young man with his, with his uh, mallet, you know? Yes. Uh, and, and, and then flings the steel shutter back. Yes. 
uh, and uh, end of scene, you know, and uh, that is uh, that that is a real. I mean, you feel as if you've been hit with that hammer, don't you? It, it, yeah. it has that kind of, of impact, and that is a brilliant film. And you, you're right; it's it's a, a, it's not for everyone, and it's it is quite a difficult film to sit through in many ways. But but that is a, a, a grueling experience. So of course, we have to realize that a lot of people don't have the horror gene, for the simple reason they don't want to have grueling experiences. You know, they want to have <laughs> they want to have escapist experiences, which is great. We all do from time to time. But the whole a lot of people, uh, I do actually meet quite a few people who are just puzzled by the, the, the whole the mere fact that one's interested in horror, because why would you voluntarily make yourself uncomfortable? just uncomfortable never mind scared why would you put yourself through that but I you know this is all this is all cod psychology stuff that's been hashed over many times but you know there is a reason why a large number of people want to put themselves through that you know it's a cathartic experience blah 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 you know you experience the ghastly stuff that if you're you know if you're lucky you will never experience in reality but but it is important to experience it in a fictional way context you know we, we've all heard those theories and of course mm. they're all fine and they, they become cliches but you know they become cliches for the very good reason that they're pretty much true mm. some people just do not have that gene it is just too unpleasant for them there's there the exciting quality of it that i mentioned just just isn't there and a film as grueling as the texas chainsaw massacre would be just just you know just anathema to them you know, mm, I mean, mm. even a relatively mine, uh, mild horror film might be anathema to them. That isn't a mild horror film. Uh, it's an extraordinarily clever and powerful film. As I, it could well be the perfect horror film. I mean, you yeah. know, how do you define that? It's impossible and it's absurd. You know, one of the, I mean, you know, I don't, uh, um, you know, respect to everybody who has asked me this, but I've many times been asked, what is your favourite horror film? Uh, and I must say, I don't care for that question. <laughs> Mm. Because it's impossible to answer. I mean, for, quite apart from anything else, you might come out with an answer, and and next week you'd come out with an entirely different answer. Mm. If you've seen enough horror films, you've got an awful lot of favourites. Because as I say, you know, quite a lot of them are bad, but even the bad ones can be very diverting. Uh, but there's an awful lot of good ones. And so, what is your favourite horror film? Is very very difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think it's funny that that idea because I I I've heard a lot of people on Twitter and and uh, you know and I think it's a legitimate point that there's a lot of snobbery against horror, but I yeah. also know that like my daughter who's a really into her films um, just turned around to me the other day and said you know what I don't think I want to watch horror movies I don't think I, I like them anymore I don't I'm just not I, I don't like being scared so there there is that and I find my own personal sort of there are certain like I really like Fulci his films. But mm. the, my problem with them is they just disgust me too much. And there's a point, so I can admire them and I can sort of see what they're doing. But all this, the wiggly worms and maggots and stuff just makes me feel ill. And it's like, do I really want to watch this before dinner? <laughs> well, I think um, Fulci may well have taken that as an affirmation. I mean, I, th I, th <laughs> I think he was... <laughs> He was perfecting a, a sort of little corner of the genre all his own, you know, and, and those emetic effects, some of which don't actually hold up too well when viewed now. Uh, I, I think in particular of um, there's a bunch of clockwork tarantulas, I think, in, in the beyond that feast on somebody's face as what else would they do in a Fulci film? But <laughs> I, see, I seem to remember that that effect actually doesn't look so great anymore. But no, Fulci's films are well. I guess they're an acquired taste. But if you're in the if you're in the mood, if you're in the vein, as it were, then uh, you know he, he, you couldn't better him. You, no, you know, Fulci made the best Lucio Fulci films of that type of anybody because they were his. They were his films, and, they, and, mm. you, and you're right. Uh, disgust was an important feature of them. But at the same time, he actually, as where atmosphere was concerned, there was quite a lot of poetry in them. So, um, and he said himself, he wasn't aware where this strange atmosphere came from. It just, it just sort of arrives. And it's, of course, it makes those films a very potent and slightly perplexing mixture of those horrendous gross out moments with brains and worms and God knows what sloshing all over the place. But there are these weirdly atmospheric poetic moments. So yeah, his films are fascinating on that level.
Yeah, you go back to that comfort that you were talking about earlier of, you know, we kind of like our our misty graveyards and, you know, can, <laughs> candelabras and whatnot. We do. We do. Well, I do. I do. Mm. And uh, I, I just, you know, it, it, that cl- the classic costume gothic thing. Mm. Uh, of course, in the last 20 years, there have been a few a few instances of people trying to revive that mode or at any rate making a film in that mode, but they are very few and far between. There seems to be a distrust of that costume gothic thing. I I guess modern audiences fancying themselves sophisticated, um, the myth of sophistication, as I call it, um, Mm. just imagine that that stuff is camp. Mm. It's just camp. I can't stand the word camp and I particularly can't stand the American variation on it, campy. Um, the reason I can't stand it is it seems to me to be applied very often by people who don't know what camp actually means. And they apply it so often to films that are not camp at all. Mm. Mm. They just apply them to films that they find laughable, which I think is a slightly different kettle of fish. Uh, but that again is to do with the snobbery directed at horror films. But it does mean that it is very difficult to make a costume Gothic film these days and uh, you know it'd be nice if somehow that particular subgenre could be revived but uh, we shall see we shall see following the sort of doldrums of the of the 90s um when when you know uh, the the horror was wasn't being made in quite the numbers that it had been um we're sort of living through something of a golden age uh, not just in terms of british horror but also with horror coming from all over the world you know i'm thinking of the um japanese horror films that that started coming out the korean started uh, arriving sure, as well yeah. And and much more sort of knowledge of the of the Italians and the uh, you know uh, the Europeans as well. Um, do you do you? I mean, looking at the the sort of rude health of horror at the moment, uh, that must be something that you're thinking. I've got another four or five books here. <laughs> well, what's particularly? But you, yes, you're right. You know, horror from all corners of the globe and uh, starting, you know, in the late nineties when all those fabulously effective Japanese horror films started arriving uh, outside Japan. And uh, what's very exciting is the fact that there seems to be a a huge um, appetite now for horror wherever it happens to come from. Uh, And what's, and of course the very exciting thing now really is the preponderance of horror on television. Mm. It's really uh, remarkable and it sh- I think it shows, I mean, you know, that it's, it's sort of people's desire to be spooked or, or maybe occasionally repulsed, but certainly scared. Um, it, 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 it's, 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 it's being transplanted into a different arena. Interestingly, it's being transplanted directly into people's sitting rooms. Mm. But nevertheless, you're right. It shows that horror is in a kind of rude health. Maybe, and maybe the snobbery that I mentioned is... Um, is, is actually ebbing away. And there have been signs that it's ebbing away, but you know, that, that, that kind of snobbery never quite goes away. There was a time when, um, you know, it, taking going back to British horror films, there was a time when uh, British horror films were looked down upon within the profession. Peter Cushing was always very happy to be in horror films. As he said, who wants to see me play Hamlet? Very few, <laughs> but, uh, millions want to see me play Frankenstein, so that's the one I do. Now, his frequent co-star, Christopher Lee, had a very different view. He was actually quite defensive about horror films. Uh, and, um, you know, he would, and, you know, the, the, the actor doth protest too much. He, he, did, he did actually go on with the defensive stuff uh, <clears throat> a bit too much. Mm. But we can see why, because within his own profession, there was... Um, there was this kind of condescension and snobbery and, and you know, um, actors very often would sneak out to make a film at Bray or whatever without, without telling their loved ones, you know, or without te- certainly not without telling their friends in the profession. It's an extraordinary uh, kind of snobbery. And it makes me laugh now because, <laughs> you know, my definition of schlocky nonsense and rubbish is something like <laughs> Downton Abbey. And yet, of course, I know Downton Abbey is now, well, they're making feature films from it, aren't they? But yeah. the actual series is now a thing of the past. But, but when Downton Abbey was current, I thought, you know, actors, British actors are falling over themselves to appear in this garbage. So 
which is <laughs> <laughs> that that needed a good chainsaw massacre right there. And yet there's no <laughs> snobbery attached to that. And yet back in the sixties, you know, if you if you went down to Bray or Shepperton to make a hammer or amicus film, you know, actors very often would keep quiet about it. Just ridiculous to me. But that's it. I think, you know, I mean, snobbery exists the world over, obviously, but uh, and I, but I don't I don't think this is a very revolutionary thought. The British are particularly good at it. <laughs> in a, in all walks of life. When The Shining, were, uh, Stanley Kubrick was uh, directing The Shining, I remember there was a, a critical reception which very much sort of explicitly said, you know, why, why is this guy wasting his time on a Stephen King novel? Oh, you get that all the time. Yeah. Of course you do. And for the same reason, whenever a vaguely, um, you know, kind of high echelon director does stoop to do a horror film, uh, I, it doesn't happen so often now, but there was a time when it always happened. Whenever somebody did that, you know, a reasonably top flight director stooped to make a horror film, they would, of course, assure you that it wasn't a horror film. You see it in interview after interview and the contortions they would get into to actually put a different label on it. It's actually Greek tragedy. Yeah, well, of course, psychological thriller is very helpful or, you know, even an inquiry into the, you know, to, into the spiritual, spiritual, I mean, who knows what, but... Of heaven forfend that you would stamp my film as a horror film. And of course, you then toddle along and see the thing. And of course, it's a bloody horror film. You know, what else is it? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that degree of self delusion is, is almost touching, I think. <laughs> I've got, there's a, um, a film director I talked to um, a, a year or so ago. He made um, Host, the, the, film, oh, yes. the Rob Savage. And yeah. he's funny because he, he did it the other way around. He started. I think it was very young, 1920, and he, he released a film which was very much an indie social realist film. And when they came and said, What's your, what do you want to do now? It was like, I want to do the films I really like, which are horror movies. And so he, he was, his calling well, card was the serious film and his career path is entirely aimed at horror. Well, hats off. Uh, hats off to that. Oh, that's great. Yes. <laughs> yes. Get in there by stealth, sort of wrong foot people by making a, a worthy film. Uh, I'm, I'm sure his film was very good. But uh, uh, and then well, what I actually want to make are, um, yeah, horror movies. I like that. That's great. That's yeah. a good way around. I like it. <laughs> anyway, but but, you know, I mean, I, th I think horror is in root health and, and that snobbery, it hasn't gone. But it's certainly in abeyance, put it that way. Do you have a line that you, you know, do you get, to, are there any ever a film where you, in terms of the gore and in terms of that sort of aspect, is there ever a film where you think, oh God, I wish I could unsee that? Or, or even maybe from a point of view, you know, I'm thinking, for some reason, I'm always thinking of the Italian movies, uh, mm. you know, something like Cannibal Holocaust, where, where the, there's some sort of political element beyond what you're seeing on the screen, such as the animal cruelty or the misogyny of some films that you think, oh, I, I, I wish I hadn't seen that. Well, I knew you were going to mention Cannibal Holocaust as soon as you talked about stuff that you would you know, prefer to unsee. Mm. Um, well, Cannibal Holocaust, in terms of animal cruelty, is a very specific case, and happily there aren't many like it. Uh, but, yes, that is a superb film, actually. Mm. It's an enormously powerful film. But it's very definitely the kind of film you don't need to see again. And a few years ago, I met the director, who was a delightful. <laughs> delightful. <laughs> I think this, this often surprises people, doesn't it? You know, the people who make the nastiest films are often the sweetest, sweetest people. Um, Deodato, yes, yeah, so he was a delight. But uh, yeah, that's an enormously powerful film. But, but again, yeah, I mean, it really isn't for everybody. There are scenes in that that are kind of inexcusable, aren't there, where, mm. where that's concerned. And where misogyny is concerned, yes, you can't escape it in some uh, genre films. Um, it's very, and you know, the older you get and uh, the more queasy it makes me feel some of that stuff. I'm happy to say that the, the general view that horror is, is sort of inherently misogynistic is not one that I share, but when you do see it, and it does turn up, Quite often, uh, well, not quite often, but it does turn up sometimes. And when you do see it, when when and this, and it's just so blatant, um, yeah, it, it is queasy stuff. And those aren't films that I much care for. And as you say, they're kind of 
watch it once and and certain items certain features of those films yeah you're right you you wish you could unsee them but you know there were there are certain films yeah where you you can't escape you can't escape from the fact that there is a misogynist impulse there you know i mean even in some quite some quite um apparently innocuous production line british films of the early 70s there was a kind of i think because the censorship pendulum has so completely swung obviously when censorship pendulums completely swing people are going to go too far initially mm. i think mm. and then they'll slow this pendulum will slowly swing back to a, a more middling place but even in even in jolly old britain in the early 70s you get the impression where some films are predicated on rape quite often you get the impression that there's an awful lot of bottled up frustration from uh, male filmmakers here but because censorship has now relaxed we can now um, take our revenge in some way. I realize that sounds a little Baroque, but uh, you do get that impression from, from some films and it's not pleasant, um, but there you go. Uh, I don't think it is absolutely endemic to horror as a genre though, which, you know, I, I would take issue with that idea. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think you're- oh, I, I know think... you're not saying that, but I think some people do. Sure, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think you're right as well, though, that at the end of the 70s, even in American film, it, it was almost illegal not to have rape scenes of of sort of stunning ambivalence, you know, it's really uh, head, oh, yes, the head scratch. I mean, Sergio Leone has horrible rape scenes in Once Upon a Time in America, for instance, which, oh, yeah, yeah. which are very, make me feel very queasy, because I'm not entirely sure where the camera is, you know, where it's, you know, what the attitude is. Uh, yes, the, it's the yes. Where where is the filmmaker coming from? You know, and mm. of course you can only you could be doing the filmmaker a disservice, but you can only respond to the film you know through your own eyes. And if you feel it's coming from a you know a bad place, then it makes it a, an unpleasant film to watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the other things that I, I noticed in your in uh, reading um, Euro Gothic, the, the, I love the uh, the thing about the comedies as well because I think that's uh, if there's a snobbery against horror movies, there's a double snobbery against sort of uh, horror comedies. And uh, I was legitimately both terrified and amused by Carry On Screaming as a child. So I, I, it, it, has a, it has a place in my heart, that sort of um, subgenre. Well, <laughs> do you mean uh, there's a snobbery against horror comedies from horror fans because they prefer their horror straight? Or, or do you mean the general populace? Uh... I mean, I can think of some amazing horror comedies like Young Frankenstein and... Uh, uh, Shaun of the Dead, which have been, you know, wildly celebrated, Fearless Vampire Killers by Polanski, perhaps as well. But a lot of those, I don't know, I don't know. I, I sort of, yeah, maybe from the horror fraternity as well as like this isn't this is just pantomiming what what we like. <laughs> well, um, I think horror is a very difficult genre to, to get right. Mm. Uh, as we discussed, it's an easy genre to do because you can do it relatively cheaply, but to get it right, it's very difficult. And in a way, I think horror comedy is even more difficult because horror and comedy, they're actually very similar commodities in many ways. And again, this is a cliche, you know, the impulse to scream and the impulse to laugh. Uh, I believe um, physiologically, they're actually very similar. Um, and of course, we're aware that when people scream in a cinema, they will often all collectively laugh directly afterwards as a release and a sort of, oh gosh, aren't we silly? And collectively, we kind of, you know, have that sense of it. So laughter and screaming are very, you know, closely knit. But when you actually deliberately go out to cultivate comedy as well as horror in a film, it's, it's weird because they are analogous things in a way, but they're so difficult to literally put together because you end up either with a film that's funny, you generally don't end up with a film that's both funny and scary, and you almost never end up with a film that's just scary. I mean, well, a film that was just scary rather than any way comic would be complete failure if, com comedy <laughs> horror was, if comedy horror was what you were aiming for, but it's very difficult to put them together. I mean, it's much easier because it's a, a parody is uh, also a difficult genre, but it is, you know, it is easy, I think, to get laughs from horror, but to also be quite scary at the same time. I think that's, that's difficult. I mean, the mm. film I mentioned earlier, The House in Nightmare Park, it's a Frankie Howard film. 
but mm. um, it is actually quite scary and it has a, a sort of piero dance by a, a bunch of a middle-aged family <laughs> playing clockwork dolls effectively which is one of the freakiest and weirdest things you'll ever see so i think i, th I think it can be done but it is awfully awfully difficult mm. it's a mm. great it's, it's it's a great it's actually a it's a very nice subgenre but mm. very difficult very difficult to do I mean, Carry On Screaming, for example, Carry On Screaming doesn't have any ambition to actually frighten you, does it? I mean, it's a carry on film. Yeah, but those guys, for some reason, the fact that you could, the guy with the block heads, those, those two, yes. they, oh, I John, don't know John, what, yeah. it, what it was, but they scared the, I mean, I'm, I must have been like seven or eight years old when I saw it, but. Well, yeah, well, well, that this is it, you see, you can never actually tell, we're going back to discovering these things as, as children, but mm. you, you can never actually tell what's going to frighten people to, to the very young mind. Yes, odd bod senior and odd bod junior. Uh, <laughs> I can see, I can well see why you'd think, why you'd be deeply disturbed by them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I don't think, Carry On Screaming is, an, is not an example of a film that wants to be scary. No, right. As yeah. well as comic, because after all, it's a carry-on film. It's, mm. it's an out-and-out comedy. But a byproduct of it, a byproduct of that, can still be you being um, freaked out as a, as, a, as a child. Yeah, absolutely. I can well see why. Emotionally scarred for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it's not that bad. Anyway, uh, yeah, so there you go. So I want to ask you a final question, which is, um, yeah. uh, would you be able to give us a, a film book recommendation somewhere, a point, pointers in the direction of a film book that you have read and, and has, you know, gripped you or influenced you or inspired you or, or, or anything really, or you just like? I can give you a couple. Um, there's a relatively old one now by David J. Scarl mm. called Hollywood Gothic. Mm. That's another of those films in Gothic in the title, but not written by me. <laughs> in fact, preceding all my books. And that is, um, that's actually a, quite a specific focus in there. That's about the process, the progress of Dracula from a novel to right. getting onto the screen. So it goes through Nos Nosferatu and um, the 1920s stage play right through to the Universal film made in 1930. And um, so that's quite a forensic examination of a fairly small sort of um, area. Uh, and it, that's a great book, I think. And, and David Scott has written loads of great stuff, but that, that's one that had a particular impact on me. For a, an extraordinary book, I think, is a, is a book by Kayla Janice called House of Psychotic Women, which is about a much wider topic. Well, the title <laughs> is borrowed from the... English release title of a Spanish horror film. Mm. Uh, but House of Psychotic Women uh, tells you all you need to know, I suppose. <laughs> but, the, but the fascinating thing about um, that film, it was a trailblazer in that uh, Kayla Janice looks at films through a kind of autobiographical lens. And it was highly unusual and very um, striking, striking book in that she you know, has that autobiographical thing running alongside very penetrating analyses of, uh, of a, a wide range of films. So where Scarl is looking at a fairly smallish corner, if you like, hmm. um, Kayla Janice is, is, a, is, a, is a, that's a, that's an extraordinary book. There's an awful lot of horror books, actually, that I've um, enjoyed. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think... Um, but I think those two might be worth, yeah, yeah, I think they're definitely uh, they might be worth featuring on, on your programme. They're certainly, they're certainly heartily recommended, put it that way. Jonathan, thank you so much for speaking to me. Brilliant books, and I, I'm so looking forward to the second volume of American Gothic. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to finishing the thing, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, but it will be, it will be, and, uh, you know, it could well be out relatively soon. We'll see. Excellent. You'll have to come back and, and talk about it when, when you've finished. Oh, happy to. Yeah. Yeah.
So that was our conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I get very aware that I keep saying the same things time and time again in these intros and outros. Uh, but hopefully everybody has turned off as soon as the interview is over so you don't have to listen to and put up with this sort of rambling innocuous series of phrases that i keep coming up with uh things like enjoy the conversation and um uh thanks go to elliot atkins for the music and ali howard for the artwork but of course thanks do go to elliot atkins for the music and ali howard for the artwork uh, one other thing uh i mentioned at the top uh, was pre-code april i think that's a, a great initiative and a great way of adding some films to your watch list that you might not ordinarily encounter and it gives you a sort of refreshing idea of um, how how Hollywood developed so I would very much recommend that you do that. Also mentioned that I recently watched Nightmare Alley the uh, Guillermo del Toro film uh, the remake of a film noir I think from the from the 40s it's got to be Tyrone Power in the lead it's I, I really enjoyed Nightmare Alley it really I really rated it 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 looks beautiful it looks brilliant which is true of all del toro's films but previous to this one i've always found his films kind of fall down somewhere along the line they sort of feel like they were they were a really good idea but for some reason i don't know what it is they're just the ideas are almost too apparent you know they're almost i can see i can see what the storyboards looked like and what the script looked like rather than see the film itself. Nightmare Alley uh, feels utterly different and a real step up, I think. For instance, I wasn't particularly keen on Shape of Water. I mean, there was, I, hadn't, I admired it. There was nothing wrong with it in, in particular, but it just felt like it was, as soon as you realised what it was trying to do, it then just became... Well, very predictable. I, I I could see all the way through it. This film is not exactly sort of t twisty turny. I mean, being a film noir, there's an element of uh, inevitability, uh, inevitability. Sorry, I'm trying to be too clever there. Inevitability to to what is going to happen. So it's not a, a case of like, oh wow, the protagonist doesn't doesn't end up in a particularly good place. That that's a shocker. But that doom is a journey a sliding journey which is is really is really interesting and bradley cooper what what an interesting actor he does so much in this film he has such a range in this film and uh, yeah he he manages to pull off that sort of he's an enigma but we kind of know who he is at the same time uh very very well and i i was really i was really impressed and, and not to just pick out bradley cooper but there's, the whole cast here is so deep. Even bit parts are being played by actors of the quality of Willem Dafoe. And that goes all the way through the cast. That goes all the way through the movie. It's not just one or two. It's like six or seven. Uh, absolutely amazing. Tony Collette, for instance. Mara Rooney's really good. Just highly recommended. I mean, I don't usually do little film reviews at the end of this, these podcasts, but... You know, uh, tape is cheap, so I thought I'd uh, I thought I'd talk about that. Okay, great. So uh, I've already thanked Elia and Ali, and I don't feel the need to do so again, because uh, that would actually be three times that I've said those words, and uh, that would be really putting a little bit too much. Um, I would be asking a little bit too much of the listener to uh, to put up with. So the last thanks goes to the listener. Thanks for joining me. And next week uh, we'll be talking to. Uh, I'll be talking to, sorry, uh, Kim Newman, author of Nightmare Movies, the Anno Dracula books, and his latest book uh, about Raymond Chandler and Boris Karloff, Something More Than Night. So uh, until then, um, take care.